Oh, he got the meat? He's like, when you know. You know. Is he sharing with you? Is that what he's telling you? No, he said he was going to bring me dinner. Oh, so he's sharing with you? Yes, he is. But not in the lawn chair capacity. It's not in the lawn chair? What did you say? <laughs> yeah, not in the lawn chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he doesn't seem like a lawn chair kind of person. Let's see. It's raining. If it doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm just yeah. gonna butt myself up. Do it. it. How much time do we have?
Hi everyone, I'm Major Kim Grossman joining you from the Lower River Platform here at Brooks Camp in Katmai National Park. Compared to the 4 million miles within the park borders, Brooks Camp is merely just a postage stamp on the map. Throughout Katmai, our park rangers spend extensive amounts of time studying the wildlife, uncovering cultural artifacts, and educating visitors in this extremely remote Alaskan location. The data collected in these areas has to be carefully obtained and preserved, which in itself can prove to be a challenge. In this interview, we dive into the roughly 500 miles of Katmai coastline. We take a look at the research that is taking place, the wildlife that is utilizing this area, and the findings in which our samples are producing. Do the bears on the coast different from our bears here in Brooks Camp? How does their geographic location and their access to these different resources affect their overall health? You can find out these answers and more to the questions in this pre-recorded interview with our coastal wildlife biologist, Kelsey Griffin. Uh, due to scheduling, Kelsey was unable to be here with us in person today, um, so we will not be hosting a live Q&A segment at the end of this broadcast. But if you stick around, we do have a special announcement to make about our upcoming events and our favorite, Fat Bears. So, and now, we have Cat Mice Coast with Kelsey Griffin. Thank you for joining us today, Kelsey. Yeah, it's great to be here. We're glad you're here. So, Kelsey's coming from uh, the coast of Cat National Park, and we're going to ask her a little bit about it today. Um, so, we're going to start off with, Kelsey, can you tell us a little bit about your role and what it is that you do? Yeah, so I work as a coastal wildlife biologist for Cat National Park. So I spend most of my time out on the coast uh, studying various wildlife species. Wonderful. Um, and we know that there are a lot of bears out there on the coast as well, not just the bears here over at Brooks Camp. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the difference, differences between the coastal bears and the Brooks bears? Yeah, so I would say the biggest difference between the coastal bears and the Brooks bears is the diet. So coastal bears, um, eat a lot of coastal items too, um, in addition to salmon like the Brooks bears. So we see bears that are clamming on the inner tidal. Um, we see bears that forage for barnacles, mussels, crabs. Um, if a beach whale is present, then a lot of bears congregate around whale carcasses. Um, and then one of the other big forage items is salt marsh plants. So those are really Wow, so do you see a difference between the sizes of the bears with this coastal diet? Yeah, um, in general it seems like the bears are a little bit smaller than the Brooks bears because um, the salmon runs aren't quite as abundant as Brooks River. But it depends because um, when I observed uh, a whole bunch of really large bears that were feeding on a whale carcass, a humpback whale that had washed up, those were some of the biggest bears I've seen. So it just depends. Wow. Wow. And what, could it ever happen that, you know, could, could bears ever um, all congregate around such a large creature like that, like while it's still alive, or is it just something where they're scavenging for leftovers? Yeah, they're mostly just scavenging for leftovers. So once the, the whale dies and it washes up, then the bears come in, and we saw like, up to almost 15 bears of plants that were feeding. All around the same whale. Yeah. yeah, all sharing a whale carcass. We even saw a wolf that came in and grabbed a, a little bit of food there too. So, um, yeah. Well, see, it's a, it sounds like it's like another place that just, again, calls many animals to the same place because of that um, very abundant resource. Yeah, we just seem to see that. Um, so, we know that you've also been looking at the scat um, inside. Um, the National Park and dissecting what you've been finding in there. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the bear scat samples you've collected and um, where you've collected them, how many bears, etc.? Yeah, so we've been doing scat collection um, beginning last summer and continued this summer. And we're really just trying to get a better sense of the breadth of bear diet on the coast and uh, potentially how important different forage items are for the bears. So we've tried to sample a whole variety of locations um, all along the coast. 
and um, it'll be really interesting to see what the results are. We're, we're still um, in the process of finishing up those results, so we still have to do the laboratory analysis. Um, but, you know, in collecting this gas, we've definitely seen a whole variety of things. Are there any unusual findings you've seen inside the scat sample? Yeah, I think uh, one scat that sort of surprised me was this to hearing more about um, what they're finding in the scat. Um, so going back to, you know, the food part of <laughs> uh, the topic. So we we're looking through scat and all comes back down to the resources here in the park. Um, we know that salmon is extremely important to a lot of the ecosystem and uh, the salmon trends that we're seeing on the coast. Uh, what do the salmon behaviors look like in bears over there? Yeah, so we just recently did a study that Delicately, which is interesting to watch. 
um, and eat the clam right out of the shell. And other times they'll just like French right into it. So, well, yes, yes. It's, it's definitely interesting to watch. Sounds like an incredible sound of ball. I know sometimes over here on the Brooks River, we hear uh, the bears chomping into a salmon, you get to skewer the crunch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of crunching involved. <laughs> Um, so on to um, observing these bears, things are done a little bit different over on the coast than they are over So here we focus on observing bears through um, identification, you know, what they look like, their behaviors, um, and where they, where they are located, position, etc. Um, but over on the coast, um, we do have bears that are taller, right? Yeah, we did taller some bears. We don't have any more bears that are so that are set up as well. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about 
the tripods, what they're there for, um, and what we're doing. Yeah, so the tripods are set up in um, different bear habitats. So we have some tripods that are saving streams, um, inner tidal, as well as solar. Yeah, we do have some, and um, right after we put up a tripod, we actually witnessed the sow with a couple of cubs come check it out, and the cubs were very curious, and they kind of like uh, stood up and, and pawed at it a little bit and checked it out, so it was kind of interesting to see that. That sounds like we could, can I see that later? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> cool. I'll show you. Perfect. <laughs> um, and um, we also know that, so maybe also along the bears, we might be catching maybe some wolves over all these cameras as well? Or we know that there are a lot of wolves on the coast. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if we've caught too many wolves on the cameras, um, since they're only every half hour, and the wolves tend to be a bit more elusive, but we could have a few uh, photos in the end. Um, but we have uh, done a wolf study that we kind of wrapped up this year um, along the coast, and so we were able to get some other cameras, like the trail cameras that we had. So we did catch um, a wolf down up here at Brooks River earlier this season. I don't know if you caught that footage or not. It was down there fishing. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> um, silly question, but do bears and wolves? Yeah, that's, you know, it's a complicated <laughs> question. And I would say it depends. So um, that's one of the things that, that's been really interesting to observe years is um, wolf bear interactions. And, you know, sometimes they're very tolerant of each other. They almost ignore each other. Other times, you know, you'll see them fishing for salmon side by side um, and, you know, very tolerant. And, and other times they can actually have more aggressive behavior. Um, I witnessed a wolf actually run and bite the bear's ankle because it was near a rendezvous site where they had pups. Wow. So the wolf was being protected as well as the bear. Wow. And, and it was able to successfully scare the bear off? Yeah, the bear kind of jumped and um, then wandered off in the opposite direction and away from the wolf. So, um, but yeah, it's been really interesting. Another time I, I saw a a younger sub adult bear and a young wolf actually kind of chase each other on the inner title and it looks like they were playing. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a whole other animal of the animal behavior that's interesting. Wow, I know we've seen um, a couple of our bears do the behavior this summer. I think we've talked several times about 909 and 910 and their cubs, but it's interesting that this transcends also to the Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, it's just such a magical place. Um, I, I love seeing the puffins flying out there on the islands. Um, the wolf activity is really special to see. Um, I think one of the more interesting things is just new discoveries. Like we, we found a, an area with a wolf and that was kind of unexpected. An area that was really close to the coast. to observe a wolf pack uh, right near the creek is a rendezvous site. That's really, really amazing to see. That's incredible. How much time do you spend out on the coast? Yeah, you know, it, it varies from summer to summer. Um, but each time we go out, we're, we're usually out for at least a week. Um, so I could be spending like up to five weeks Everybody, stay tuned for all the for all the new data observations that Kelsey um, sees <laughs> coming up next year. Um, and you know, there's one other thing that we want to talk about as well when we're thinking about the coast. We know that the coastal areas are more susceptible to climate change. Um, any changes that you yourself have noticed out there? Yeah, I think the biggest change that I've witnessed um, was related to ocean. Um, we had a great heat wave a few years ago, and uh, it really impacted the coastline. Um, it affected forage fish and um, all of the predators that feed on those forage fish. So we had this warmer ocean temperature anomaly, and we were actually seeing um, increased seabirds dying along the coast. That's, that's one of the things that's pretty high to see that, you know, that temperatures are changing. what happens when there are these changes um, so that we have a better sense of what to expect. Um, but the other thing we can do is just uh, try to be good stewards um, in, in everyday activities and when we visit these special places um, so that we can protect them. been in the past and where we can go in the future. Um, you know, back in 1989, like some out in the oil spill. Are we seeing any long-term impacts? Have the bear population been impacted by this? Um, Egypt? Um, but how are all the coastal actions moving, you know, it being about 30 years ago? Yeah, well, I think, you know, most of the wildlife species have rebounded since then, which is really great. The most important thing is to just continue monitoring and tracking changes in the wildlife population. Yeah, like you said, there's still oil that persists on, on some of the beaches, so we can't have last few Yeah, so we need to keep monitoring and keep trying to recorrect, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, last thing, you know, many people come here to Katmai to come see all the bears at the falls. Um, but also, a lot of people are coming to the coast as well, we see. So, for all of our um, higher education, any sort of ethics that we should keep in mind? Yeah, I think uh, just being aware that, you know, these are wild animals and, you know, they have personal space goals just like we do. So, just uh, being really respectful of the wildlife and, and also being respectful of other visitors and um, trying to keep area with you know, a lot of solitude and just respecting the wildlife. Beautiful. Yeah. Let's keep protecting the animals and the environment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, well, I think that's all I have for you today, Kelsey. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, this is Kelsey Griffith, Coastal Wildlife Biologist. Yeah. Thank you.
we usually focus on Brooks Camp and the bears specific to this region, Katmai is an expansive area and enables just this incredible research into the lives of brown bears throughout various terrains of the park. What we see is that even though brown bears rely more heavily on vegetation in coastal areas, salmon plays a vital part in the survival of all of Katmai's brown bears, including here in Brooks, over on the coast, and all the areas in between. So these coastal resources provide sustenance not only for a healthy population of bears, but also for several species of seabirds, wolves, and you know many other mammals as well. It's up to us to help these ecosystems and to help protect them. So in the next couple of weeks, um, we will also be connecting with a wildlife biologist to chat more about the coast and more specifically about wolves on the coast. So stay tuned for that. But coming up this next week, it's the time we've all been waiting for. Make sure to stay tuned next week as we are ramping up for our biggest event of the year, Fat Bear Week and Fat Bear Junior. These events celebrate all of the tremendous work these bears have put into gaining weight all summer long in order to survive winter hibernation. Kicking us off next week is our Fat Bear Junior Bracket. Um, we are going to reveal our contenders on social media on September 26th, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to pit Fluff against Chubb. And we want to know who you think is going to make the bracket. After next week's live event, where we discuss um, bear communication methods uh, during our bear language chat, we're going to go ahead and take a look further into some of these cup contenders for the Fat Bear Junior and highlight some of their best moments from the summer. We are excited to see who is going to get your vote. And for any educators out there who are interested in getting their classes involved, we need your student questions. Fat Bear Week in the classroom is where our rangers are going to answer questions submitted by your students. So check out this link to submit them. And we want to thank everybody who joined us today and to all the folks at explore.org. We are excited about the array of events coming up. And in the meantime, we want everybody to remember, never stop learning.